So now, as uh, Peter alluded to, we're going to fill up these seats here with some of the experts and people who uh, made the scene, just weren't part of the scene, they helped make the scene up here. Um, and to uh, coax some stories out of them <laughs> is uh, our moderator for the panel, Beth Harrington, the, the filmmaker. And I just wanted to say a few words about Beth. Um, that she has this quality about her that just oozes integrity. It's, it's this uh, quality that uh, has allowed her almost unheard of access to the Carter Cash family, which is going to make this uh, documentary film she's working on now probably a definitive thing. And. Um, I know because uh, I was part of a, another project she worked on. She's done a couple of films for, uh, more than a couple, for uh, Oregon Public Broadcasting for the Oregon Experience uh, uh, series. And one of them was uh, Birabana, if, we, if anyone saw that one. Um, there was a couple of claps up there, good. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I, one of the interviews she did was with me, and uh, I know I wasn't that interesting, and she just looked at me like, oh, this is great stuff. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, we're really happy that Beth wanted to be part of this project, and uh, um, I know that uh, she's already talked to uh, the panelists and got a sense of their backgrounds and is going to uh, kind of oversee the proceedings here. So let me just uh, read her bio and give you a better sense of her background. She's an award-winning independent producer, director, and writer, born in the Bean Town, Boston, home of the Red Sox that aren't doing very well this year, kind of like the old days. She transplanted to the Pacific Northwest and has been making media professionally since 1977. She most often focuses on work that explores American history, music, and culture. Harrington's independent production, Welcome to the Club, The Women of Rockabilly, a music documentary about the pioneering women of rock and roll, was honored with a 2003 Grammy nomination and has been seen on public television and at film festivals film festivals in the United States and abroad. This and other work uh, reflect a long-standing love of music and a previous, oops, sorry. Uh, this and other work reflect a long-standing love of music. In a previous lifetime, she was a rock and roll singer herself, most noted for her years as a member of the Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers and the Warner Brothers. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome What other organization would hire a staff historian for a chain of group clubs? really great. And I'm also really happy to be here with Peter. He, I really respect his work. If you haven't read Rock and Roll Archaeologist, you really should. It's a great read. It's one of my favorite books. It's out of print. Oh my god, eBay. <laughs> on um, so tonight I'm really pleased to, this has been a, it's been a, quite a week for me, and it's all about music this week, and it's only Tuesday. <laughs> um, tonight I'm really honored to be uh, here to sort of help shepherd a discussion that I think will be pretty free-flowing and won't really need me much at all. Um, but I'm going to tell you who you're going to be meeting tonight, and uh, we'll get them up here. Um, should I just introduce people and give them one, one at a time? Should we do that? Okay. Um, our, I'm first going to introduce um, Bobby Gibson. Portland, Oregon, on TV 
shows, as we saw, such as the Heck Harper Show, played gigs with Willie Nelson while he was a disc jockey at K-Van Radio. But Bobby's also played on the national stage. I have greatly condensed this bio. This could go on for a while, so we're going to let Bobby fill in. But he's been on shows like Town Hall Party in Los Angeles, which is a favorite of mine, and Cousin Herb Hansen show in Bakersfield. He was on KWTO Radio in Springfield, Missouri, which is a really cool uh, country station. And, on the, and he also appeared on the heavyweight Ozark Jubilee featuring Red Foley. Um, he eventually moved back to Vancouver, and as Peter noted, uh, started Ripcord Recording Studios and Ripcord Records, and we're going to be talking to him about that. So I welcome Bob Gibson. Ray Monty, where are you, Ray? so I'm going to condense this one too. As a youngster, steel guitarist Ray Monty made weekly appearances on radio stations KLE and KPOJ on a kid's talent show called Journal Juniors. That was the Oregon Journal's show, I guess. Right? Those are shows. From about age 14 through his early 20s, Ray was a member of Arky and his Jolly Cowboys, the most popular country dance band in the Northwest during the 1940s and 50s. They were the house band at the Division Street Corral, located at Southeast 171st and Division, and, and that obviously in Portland. Ray also played with Tommy Kizia's West Coast Ramblers at the same venue. In, his early, in the early 1960s, Ray played his Bigsby quad steel guitar on the Circle 8 Hoedown television program behind Heck Harper. So these gentlemen have sort of related histories. We'll be able to bounce off, be back and forth between you two, I suspect. So welcome, Ray Monty. And now, representing the ladies, I'd like to bring up Artie Lang. We both got the memo about the nice jackets tonight. <laughs> Look at that great jacket she's got. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> Artie Lang is a core figure in the Northwest music scene, a longtime fan of country music. Artie was part of Willie Nelson's fan club after following him on K Van Radio in Vancouver, Washington. She worked at Taylor's Viewpoint, really important country club, um, country music club, I should say. It makes you sound like you were golfing. Um, I was. <laughs> um, and she worked, you worked your way up from working in the, as a coat check girl to admission taker, booking acts, to really involved in, in Taylor's viewpoint. It's really instrumental in that arena. As uh, Peter mentioned, she co wrote with Buck Owens, He Don't Deserve You Anymore. We're going to get the story behind that tonight, I hope. And, uh, and she, as well as other songs, and she's a chronicler of everything country here. She has an extensive memorabilia collection from what I understand, lots of great photos. And so please welcome Artie Lang. Thank you. And we have a, a, a surprise guest that I'm very excited about, Steve Melnichuk. Could are you there, Steve? Come on up. Um, we were just talking, played with Heck Harper, um, also. Uh, he's from British Columbia, so he's, a, he's an outlier here, right? <laughs> um, alien. An alien. An alien. <laughs> he's also not only a country musician, but he was a physics instructor, which makes him a very well-rounded <laughs> Um Played the Circle 8 Hoedown with Heck Harper. Um, he was a featured singer. Uh, he also played mandolin guitar, but told me mostly bass. Uh, he worked every rodeo in Oregon. Um, he uh, taught for 36 years at San Diego State, Colorado School of Mines, but always kept music as his avocation. Um, and he said to me, um, he's been picking and grinning for a long time, 
And he said, if I didn't have to grin, I'd do a lot more. So please welcome Steve. <laughs> He also taught in Portland, not just San Diego State and Colorado School of Mines. So I'm delighted we have these folks here tonight. Um, I, I think because Peter's provided such a, an overarching framework for things that I'm going to um, open it up to you for. I'm, I'm going to throw out some questions, get you talking. I may jump in once in a while, but I really would like to hear sort of the stories behind some of the, the history we saw and we heard from Peter. So I, I'd just kind of like to start off quickly by asking you to you know, briefly tell me a little bit about what the scene was like here when you were growing up, which is to say, um, as I understand it, there weren't that many uh, country music programs, there were hardly any places to find records. So I want to know from you, how did you, um, how did you develop your love for country music? Where did that come from when you were young? Uh, the radio stations. Just had me KVAN. Mm -hmm. I think that was the first one I listened to a lot. And uh, every morning, uh, Buddy Fight and I and Willie Nelson would walk up those stairs there and I said we would go up there just to sit through the show. It didn't matter whether we played or not. It was just part of the things we did. And um, Leo Erickson, I don't know if that that's a pretty well known name around here. He's the one that built the KWJJ Towers and all that stuff. Was the engineer on that show. And. Uh, and uh, these guys all remember that too. And uh, I can't remember yesterday. You can't remember yesterday. Well, <laughs> yeah, I was just telling Ray that I can't remember the names I used to drop. <laughs> we'll help you with that. How about you, Ray? Where, where, when did, how young were you when you first fell in love with country music, and when, where did that come from? Uh, I was a little youth. Okay. Moving a little bit. Moving a little bit. Like this. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, I started when I was seven, and in those days you had to uh, take classes. They didn't have private teachers, and uh, I went through the series a couple years in a row and just kept it progressing until one of my last teachers decided that uh, she didn't want to teach me anymore because I wouldn't read the sheet music. And she had told my folks to buy all the records that uh, they could and set me down in front of them and listen to them. So Eddie Arnold and Roy Wiggins on steel guitar was my first exposure, and from there it just was contagious. It went on and on. And I hear you had a chance, fairly young, to see some of the Grand Ole Opry stars. Um, isn't there? A yes, I that? forget what year it was. Um, my dad was working uh, just as a part-time for extra money thing at Jansen Beach, and he was working as a parking attendant and security guard. And somebody approached him about uh, handing out circulars for car windshields for everybody in the parking lot. And if he could pass out uh, 2,000 of them, he'd get free tickets to the Grand Ole Opry. And so that was I, when they came to town. Right. Uh -huh. And I was enlisted to do that and got to go down and see Red Foley and Grady Martin on lead guitar and Billy Robinson on steel guitar. They played at the auditorium. So that was my first <laughs> The real big time. That was, and was that the first time you saw someone play Steel live? Yeah, really a professional, yes. Cool. Cool. Artie, how about you? When did you get the bug for country music? Oh, well, I think up in Canada, when I would visit my relatives, they always had country music on radio. And then after high school, I started working at the VA the hospital. And, uh, Shorty, the higher hand's wife worked there as a dental hygienist. And Shorty, the higher hand, was uh, one of the DJs she at the K-Band, right? DJs at k yes. And I got to know them, and they took me around to all the different country music shows. That's about it. <laughs> that sounds like the way to do it. And Steve, when did you get the interest in country music? Well, probably at three years old. Three? <laughs> really five. Um, I first started on a chromatic accordion in one row, you know, you, you pull one way and it's a note, pull another, say the other direction, it's another note. Like uh, to the, yeah, the Cajun kind of stuff. But um, 
I even, Bob, I was even at a theater on stage with this little accordion at five years old. I, I'm sorry. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember what song was, but I think it was Over the Waves. It was Over the Waves. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we listened to up there mostly country music up in the apple orchards in the Okanagan Valley. Uh, I think I knew the words to every Hank Williams tune ever published, ever sung. And also we had Montana Slim up there that sang country and Hanks, you know. So uh, the start was with all of this uh, uh, country music. We didn't know any other music, really. Uh, then when I came here, uh, I had in high school played in a three-piece dance band every Saturday uh, to make money to save for college. And uh, entertainment at halftime was to go in the parking lot to sit in the person's car that drove me there. I was playing stand-up bass and watch uh, the beer bottle fights. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, so since that time I had uh, finished high school, came here sitting on a post near the uh, Joe Stadium, which you know, which was a, it was the stadium then. And Heck would drive, Heck Harper would drive out of PTV and his uh, white Cadillac with gold rims. <laughs> and I'd wave at him and after waving 10 or 15 times, he stopped one time and I said, hey, did you ever need a bass player that kind of sing? Boy, I'm sure, I need money then. You know, it's, uh, it's a sophomore in Portland State. Anyway, so he stopped, he says, why should you? Do you have a bass? I said, yeah. Well, I did this. I rented it. <laughs> but I rented one from Portland Music. It showed up in KGW, where he went to, and from that on went the Circle A Down and uh, the Heck Harper Show, That's right. and all of that, every show. Awesome. Uh, now, that's a fantastic story. Both um, so Ray and Bob, you also played with Heck. We were all three in the Heck Harper band at the same time. At the same time. And then, um, some of these uh, things that Peter was showing there, the two girls, the, the sweethearts, Norm and Linda were both on the show, the Heck Harper show with us, and then they went to Los Angeles. Dwayne and Sharon Weir were on that show. They went and performed on the, on the uh, Lawrence Welk show. And then we, uh, me and my ex-wife Carla Grove, went to Los Angeles, and we were there for a year on those shows down there. So Norm and Linda, the two girls, and all of us were down there for about a year in Los Angeles on those local shows down there. So that's when you start doing Town Hall Party and those kinds of shows, or? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's when I appeared on Town Hall Party. And, and um, I um, got my first chance on Town Hall Party to play one night because Jay Stewart, that ran uh, one of the uh, uh, shows on uh, their game shows, um, one night, Joe Mavis and Merle Travis had been drinking too much. <laughs> and so Jay comes running out and he said, Bob, you got your guitar? And I said, yeah, I do. And so I, I, that's how I got my first break on that show. And then I was around for about a year. It was on that show that I met Glenn Campbell when he was the guitar player for the Champs and Will Clearback and all the other guys. And those guys used to hang around backstage, all of those big name guys. I mean, that later became big name guys. And there was a lot of famous people on that show. In those days, by the way, he mentioned Carla Rowe, who passed uh, about two years ago, if you remember her from the Hank Harper Show. Anyway, um, at that time, now if you go to see a country show, you usually go to Brands and Myrtle Beach for the, the uh, Geplin Brothers and uh, on and on. They have their own theaters, but then they did not, most of them, so they would tour with their bands, many times without their bands, and get uh, bands um, in local areas to accompany them. And this is how uh, we got to play with uh, George Jones's and Lefty Purcells and the Carl Smiths and on and on and on. In fact, someday Bob will tell you how I saved George Jones's life. <laughs> oh, you can, uh, we can't wait. We want to hear this. Don't we? What did wow. you do? Hi, <laughs> <laughs> What did you do to save George's life? Well, kept him from falling six feet into a pavement Whoa. down off a stage. Oh. Uh, I, I will tell this, yeah. <laughs> In those days, you know, George Jones, George Jones would show up mostly without his band, and sometimes he wouldn't show up. Uh, pretty well we had that time. Uh, we're doing a, a backup show to Hank Snow with Carl Smith, George Butler, uh, Butlers, and so on at uh, Hank Snow at uh, the Coliseum here. 
things. And the stage was real high, like six, seven feet. <coughs> and they had seating of about 800 people out there. So we come out and accompany the artists that uh, didn't bring their bands, which were most of them. And uh, I would have a stand-up bass. On times when I wasn't playing it, I'd set it on the stand. So I didn't have to hold it all the time. Well, he had a few that night, and he got on stage, and it was during White Lightning, and uh, then while the band was playing, he was backing up, and I was playing my bass not on my stand. And he kept backing up, and backing up, and backing up, and then he tripped on my stand, and he turned around, and he was about ready to break his neck. But uh, unfortunately, he played my bass stand, so the people could uh, look and say, well, it wasn't me, it was his bass stand. <laughs> it wasn't me. Yes, I saved his life. <laughs> <laughs> Some people don't realize, uh, probably never give this any thought, but I've always considered us local bands, us guys who played in the nightclubs and all of that stuff. When somebody would have a hit song, and they would come to town, do their show, and they'd go away and not come back for six months or a year, we actually kept their music alive until they got back. Yeah. Keep it warm. And, and I know you know, we never thought of it that way, but yeah, we're, we're doing Merle Haggard song. We do it time after time. Uh, you know, until, until Merle comes back to town, then he gets it for one day. Then we go back to doing his song until he comes back. And, then, <laughs> and we, well, that's that's where we got all of our material. You know, that's it's a mistake point. to do original song. You got to do his song. <laughs> that's a great yeah. point. Hey Ray, uh, tell us about um, you started playing when you were. What, 14? You, when you first got a steady gig? Like yes, that? professionally, yes. And, and what, who was that with? Arky, the Jolly Guy Boys. And how was that? I, tell us about Arky. Yeah, tell us about Arky, what he told you about his daughters. <laughs> <laughs> you also played with Arky, right, Bob? I was in that band. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, Ray, tell us about Arky. Um, Arky was, well, everybody in the band was in their 35, late 35 or 40s, and I was 14, 15. And, and he came over like an orientation uh, big company he came over and sat down and kneed a knee and he's crossed his arms and said, now you know he said there's only one rule here that really is going to be enforced and i said well what's that he said you don't lay a hand on my wife or any of my three daughters or i'll kill you <laughs> and, uh, so uh, that made an impression well 25 or 30 years ago i was laying down in um, Lebanon in Oregon at uh, Cottonwood's Ballroom. And there was a, by this time, a, a middle-aged lady sitting out there, kept looking at me and rolling her eyes, and I didn't know who she was. And finally, she came up with break time. She said, don't you recognize me? And I said, no, I don't recognize you, I'm sorry. I didn't even recognize Steve tonight. That's how tough things are for me. <laughs> anyway, she, uh, she said, well, I'm Mary Benedict. That's nice. And uh, she said, you remember when you used to come to my dad's house with the band breakfasts? And I said, yeah, I remember that. And she said, well, you know, she said, I used to have the hottest crush on you. And you never once even looked at me when I walked into the room. Why was that? Well, I told her about a little session with her father, and she just had to be almost fainted. She couldn't believe it. <laughs> but, uh, but she thought you just weren't interested. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, I didn't mean to break her heart, you know, but things like that. <laughs> well, you can tell her what else she said, though, about she went through her whole life wondering why nobody liked her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I got I to gotta tell you something about Skip. You know, we would take, when we'd have out-of-town trips, we take different cars. It's your turn to drive, okay, put the bass in, put the amps in, and so on. But he had this habit of not staying up too late, so he'd start snoozing a little bit, and when it was his turn to drive, everybody said, hey, you're really gonna drive? Are you taking your car? And we kind of suggest maybe somebody else would drive. <laughs> and the way we knew it, two or three in the morning, coming from the coast, that we're in danger is when we heard gravel. <laughs> and we'd quickly shake them. <laughs> We went. And that is the end of it. I think it was D. Corral, we're backing up uh, Ray Price. He was on steel oh, yeah. the big steel with the four and a half sitting there. But uh, uh, you have to understand that on these guitars, you have a foot pedal or volume. And as you lean forward and your foot goes forward, the volume goes up, 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 up. 
And so he's sitting there and something's going on and it's not his turn and he's starting to nod. <laughs> and while he's nodding, now I still can remember this, while he's starting nodding further and further, the foot goes further and further all the way to the bottom of the volume panel. And about at that point, his forehead hit his <laughs> in the middle of a song, and I think he came out of there like he thought he was shot. Well, I, that. I don't mean to own this, but uh, uh, when I was in Tommy Kazaya's band one night, uh, we were playing songs, and you know, one guy will play, and the next guy will play, and the next guy will play, and it comes back to you. Anyway, I, I was aware it was my turn. So I played Missouri Wolves. I was just so proud. I was the key of F with everybody else. And everybody started to laugh. And then point and then play some other song. I just <laughs> I barely, Not Missouri Wolves. Apparently I'm totally asleep. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I bet it's still sounding great though. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned oh, By the way, Beth, uh, uh, Bob hadn't mentioned this, but uh, the Heck Harper show, he and I and everybody else spent uh, was it five or six days at the Calgary Stampede one year playing? Yes, we did. Steve and I have played for Queen Elizabeth. Wow. Um, but we have. I can see her over there in the distance, and I turned up just in case I wanted her to hear me. And I've ha I had the greatest urge to go over there and say, Hey, Liz, how they sound? <laughs> <laughs> but we did, we, and, and tell them the rest of them, we rode the Canadian National train from Vancouver, B.C. to Calgary with a, with a whole group of can-can girls in the group. Uh, yeah, you want to tell the rest? Uh, well, we did have, remember Gene Barry, the, uh, what was his name? Ben uh, Masterson. Ben Masterson, he was on the show. The, he couldn't sing, but the only song he knew was, When the Red Red Robin Goes Bob. <laughs> Yeah. He'd come up and do that. Yeah. And then uh, also Tex Ritter was there with uh, his family and so on. So that was quite a ride. <laughs> that really was, for sure. You mentioned the um, D Street Corral a minute ago. And I, I wanted to ask Artie, because it sounds like you and Shorty and his wife spent a lot of time really in the scene. You knew you worked at the Viewpoint. You knew the, all the other clubs. Can you describe some of those clubs? Because none of us, have, or a lot of us in the audience, haven't been to them. Um, what, what, what was the you know, what was the viewpoint like? Tell me about what the vibe was like at the viewpoint. Oh, it was the place to go. You know, uh, all the big stars would come there. And Give us some examples of what kind of people would be there. Oh well, of course, Buck Owens and Merle Haggard. Uh, you know, Excuse me, Del Reeves. And like that. <coughs> what I wanted to say, uh, people back in the day probably know Ray more by Skipper. I was just going to say that yeah. you mentioned Skipper Steve, and that Ray is also yeah. a Skipper. I, 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 I get by with that. Um, <laughs> uh, at the viewpoint, Charlie Pride um, on his first tour. Um, it was really interesting. He came to play with us. Remember that Artie? And, yes. And we, we had booked him for one night. Well, some of the folks that had booked Charlie Pride uh, didn't know what nationality he was. <laughs> and so they canceled him. And Pete Taylor was kind enough to keep Charlie Pride on for four more nights because he needed the money. And Charlie Pride, uh, the one that we know, is a very nice, well-educated, uh, fine person. And uh, so we kept in there. Uh, there's a picture on my website with Charlie Pride, and I shouldn't have done it, but I said, uh, Charlie Pride, and I'm the one on the left. <laughs> <laughs> Just and, be clear. Uh, but that was Charlie's very first tour, and Charlie was discovered by Red Foley. He was singing up in Montana when Red Foley uh, discovered him right there. And of course, the rest is history with him. He had a lot of big hits. Yeah, and then um, Charlie would just stop in at the viewpoint on his way through, even if he wasn't booked, you know, mm -hmm. just because Pete did that. So Pete actually just kept him working while he was able to rebook his tour? Is that what happened? We, uh, we kept him for four nights because he had some cancellations and he really needed the work. Uh, his tour, his uh, yeah, uh, whole career was just starting, so it wasn't all. And I, I noticed you were talking about earlier about nonprofit. We know a lot about that. 
Yeah. 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 Tell us the story of how you ended up writing with Buck. Oh, well, I had written some lyrics, and uh, he was playing at the club, at the viewpoint, and um, he took them, and he says, yeah, I'll look at these, and he says, I'll let you know. Well, the next time he came, he was up on the bandstand, looking right at me, and started singing this song, he don't deserve you anymore which I had written, he doesn't, but old Buck made a country. <laughs> and uh, from there, uh, Susan Ray recorded it, Tony Booth, um, see, there were several others. I heard it was a big hit in Australia at one point, but it's a really it long could be. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, and so well, you, were you writing a lot then? What, what, what was that? Oh, just off and on, and uh, give a few more, but nothing really went. Uh -huh. uh, and then um, several other artists, like uh, Eddie Elvin, he was the cowboy in the Continental Suit, he recorded a few. Uh -huh. And, uh, oh, I wanted to mention, uh, Buddy Simmons' name came up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, I just wanted to say that he did pass away the other day, in case. About four days, about four days, five days ago. Yeah. Two. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about Buddy and the Simmons family? Because that, that's a really interesting... Well, family. he had uh, two boys who really got into the country music. Larry, um, he even toured with Ray Stevens for a yes, while, did. didn't he? Um, and then Donnie was his other son. They were all in music, and Donnie was in a real bad motorcycle accident. He lost one foot, but um, they were a great band, and Susan Ray really kind of got her start, I think, with them. Uh, um, okay. Heck, uh, Buddy Simmons was Heck Harper's bass player, yeah. and I took his place when he quit to go on with his, with his band. Yeah. Uh, Buddy was also in a couple of these pictures showing up here of different bands. Uh, he played down at Ongsville Pavilion with Larry and, and his band down there. And then uh, Buddy was at, with KR our radio in Gresham for years in one of the main stations after uh, KBN kind of tapered off and that was kind of the station to listen to. Now I would be remiss because we're talking about personalities. I would be remiss if we did talk a little bit about Willie. I will start, let me start out by saying Willie is no different today than he was when I knew him 55, 60 years ago. I, uh, I, I have the privilege of having an all-access pass, which I know you don't have one. <laughs> but I'll know that to you. I was going to say, Pete mentioned that he was fired from KPA. Yeah, yeah I, was, I had never heard that. And I had needed a story I heard was he had the evening or nighttime, I guess late night uh, spot, and he put a long play record on, <laughs> left hell. <laughs> so I guess he knew about everybody in town. <laughs> well, also, there's more to that story. Willie really left. Uh, uh, KVAN because May Axton, Hoyt Axton's mother, had, had suggested that he move to Nashville as a writer. And most people don't know how Willie and his mom got out here. How's that? They brought a trailer house to Toppenish, Washington, or Sunnyside up there, called a driveway, and what you do is you tow these out and get paid for it by manufacturers. And so they brought a trailer house up from Texas, probably a small one or some sort, and ended up up there near Yakima, and then uh, Willie had heard about Ann Jones leaving KBAN, which I knew Ann quite well, I'd even played in her band. I knew Pat Mason quite well. And uh, so that's how Willie ended up at KBAN and uh, stayed out here for quite some time. And by the way, that record you showed up there, Willie, Artie has that record. <laughs> and it's in criminal condition. And now we know what it's worth, Artie, $500. <laughs> Darn it, I offered $10 for it. Just gonna take it for smart one. Peter, I'm, I'm, 
I don't want to hog all of this. You, You're doing great. Well, no, I wonder if you, there was anybody in the history, history, is there anything you'd like to elaborate on with these folks? Are there any personalities? Well, or? One of my favorites uh, performers is was Buck Owens, and uh, a couple, an hour or so ago, a couple of these boys were telling me a story about his uh, famous sidekick, uh, Don Rich. Oh, was yeah. A, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Chicken picking guitar man, one of the best from the region ever, and uh, he was from Tumwater, Washington, but I guess he played down here. Can you guys kick off that story again about Don, young Don Rich coming down here and playing? Yes. Uh, when the Heck Harper show, the Circle 8 Hoedown, was uh, full hour and rolling, he would come down. Um, every two weeks, I believe it was, on the show, the, the mother or father would bring him down. That was and, and grandma. Uh, yeah, and uh, he would uh, do, he, I never knew he played fiddle. He would do Hank Williams tunes and good cowboy tunes with his big hat on. And his real name is not Donna Rich, it was Donnie Ulrich, but he changed to Don Rich as a stage name. Anyway, he'd show up, do these wonderful numbers, and had beautiful voice and so on, and then before we knew it, he disappeared and shows up with Buck Owens. So kind of also, Don Rich is one of the <laughs> nicest people I ever knew. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of, I, I'm fascinated um, by Pat Mason. He just keeps, as we saw in Peter's presentation, he just keeps surfacing and doing all these incredible things. He's a DJ, and he's a promoter, and, and he's also very responsible for bringing the rockabilly, rock and roll acts to the area and actually around the country too. I was looking at his bio and the people he he promoted were all of the famous rock and roll acts of the day and the doo-wop groups, the coasters and Fats Domino and you know any famous rockabilly person. Um, when he was doing that, what was that like in the scene? When when he was bringing in some of those acts, um, how was that perceived? Do you guys remember you guys that? Remember I'm the oldest one here, so I probably remember more of that. Yeah, Greg, Greg. Yeah, I used to go to Wagon Hill Park as a kid. Uh, a lot that of these Camus, people here. Is that Camus, by the way? Is that where that was in Camus? Yeah, uh, Camus, uh -huh. yes. And uh, Pat owned that park, and it was a skating rink, and, uh, and uh, they, he was one of the few first guys around here to bring in the big name acts. What people don't realize is, is we didn't have nightclubs to play in when we first started here. We didn't get liquor by the drink in order until somewhere in the, I'm thinking the mid 40s or somewhere in there. So the Oregon did not have nightclubs. They had what they called bottle clubs where you brought your own bottle into the club and you handed it to the bartender and he put your name on the bottle and then he served you the set of drinks. And uh, before that, we didn't have any places to play, but after that came into being and we had the nightclubs and those jobs started opening up for us guys to be able to get paid a couple of bucks to play. So when it was, was that what happened at the wagon wheel? Well, the wagon wheel, of course, I don't believe ever had liquor, but Pat was so uh, influential, I almost got off the subject there, but, no, but Pat was bringing in all these big name acts and some of the first big name acts we ever seen, uh, that Ann Jones group that you showed the all girl group, they played there at Wagon Wheel Park for Pat. Well, that was the first place I saw Willie, I think. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, he wasn't brought in, it's a big act. Our friend Wes Balkin, who's a steel player from, uh, that was with Channel 2 News here in Portland for years, who now lives in Phoenix, so, uh, Wes, uh, we got a call from um, uh, the guy that did the last bio for Willie Nelson, and he was asking us for information, and Wes came up with a poster of the Portland Rose Parade, and I think the first guy was um, something like Claire Mustard and Powder River Rambles. The second guy on the bill was uh, another one of the local bands that we played with. And the third one was Texas Willie Nelson. He got third billing because he was just a DJ over at KVAN. And so uh, that's in Willie's second biography. And uh, so we furnished a lot of material for that, too. When, when those guys did shows, I know I'm getting off the track because I want to get back to Pat Mason, but when those guys did the radio shows, did did any of those people, because they were performers also, did they perform on the shows or were they just spinning records? Well, actually, uh, there was some live music. There was a lot of live music shows back in those days when we were kids, where, you, where people would bring in a guitar and uh, just sing songs, and the, the whole show was that. Yeah, Dallas Turner was one. Uh, Dallas Turner, you know, who ended up writing a lot of huge hit records, was, was from this area, and I actually knew Dallas when I was about uh, 13 or 14 years old because of 
the people I was living with uh, was a friend of his. And um, so that he ended up with a huge writer career. And wasn't Dave West also? Uh, also Dave West, and uh, God, I haven't heard that name in years. I'm glad you remember it, but I don't, didn't remember that. Hey, I'm curious about Dallas Turner, because I don't, I'm unaware of any recordings by the guy, but uh, did he actually have a good voice, or was he a better songwriter? Because other artists were recording his songs, but he apparently didn't. Well, let me say this about that. <laughs> Uh, Willie Nelson took me and Buddy Fight in the back room at KVA and he said, here's a new song I wrote. <laughs> we are just teenagers. What do we know about new songs? We don't know nothing. We didn't know whether the songs were good, bad, or otherwise or had any potential. We just said, okay, or something like that, you know what it would say. But that's how it was in those days. We were just getting in the music business and we were playing the only three chords we knew, so, so, so we didn't really know much, you know. And um, everything that we've learned since then has been accumulative. Pretty big word for me, but. I'll <laughs> <laughs> answer your question, right or not. But I'm just curious about Dallas's vocal skills. Did he have an appealing voice? Because again, well, so, I can't remember very far back. I mean, uh, you know, we're talking. Uh, anybody want to know how old I am? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm so old. I'm so old. The other day, I was filling out this thing for for my um, email. You know, the, my password and all that. And it said that they needed uh, six characters and a capital. I'm so old. I, I, I got, got confused. I put. Goofy, Dopey, <laughs> and, um, and Sacramento. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what that is. Oh, no, that's not I'm sorry, Peter. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to fall asleep here. Now. <laughs> talking about uh, Don Rich and Buck Owens. How many of you have been to Bakersfield and or at the at, uh, at the Palace, huh? Crystal Palace, yeah. Crystal Palace, wonderful place. It's got all the uniforms, uh, multicolored guitars, uh, like the American flag, and also, uh, this was interesting in that we arrived and it was sold out on a Saturday, going on through Palm Springs, to Palm Springs. So, uh, we told them that, hey, you kind of know some of the guys, and Doyle Holly is still playing the Buckaroos, all the other ones. Doyle's still there. Yeah, Doyle's still there. 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 Doyle's the other Doyle is playing baseball. Now, this was Don Holly. He recognized uh, really? us from uh, Don Rich. Does he know he's dead? <laughs> he doesn't. Uh, but the point is that uh, they do a buckaroo show there with the buckaroos and so on. And yeah, that was the Doyle Holly. So it was before he passed. Uh, last time we were at Crystal Palace, uh, Buck was uh, not feeling well. He, he uh, had. Uh, Cancer of the tongue, and uh, so he was just barely able to do his shows. Yeah, he was very struggling to it. It was uh, quite a show he put on, but the museum is just wonderful. That's great. Great. That's great. Hey, um, I, I, I want to get back to Pat first for a second and, and talk about the, that transitional period. I, I feel like when uh, maybe I'm just sort of curious about. What happened when some of the rock and roll acts were brought in locally? Do you guys have a... Well, they just readjusted, uh, just like the D Street Grill did. It originally was all country acts, and then eventually as somebody would come along and have a hit record like the Kingsman or something like that, and they were kind of local, or they'd bring them in, and, and they drew great crowds, and, the, and just evolution is what it was. But did that affect what you guys were doing? They put us country figures out of work for 10 years. Well, yeah, that's what I was wondering, right? We had a choice of either playing rock and roll or playing country, and uh, me and him went to flying airplanes and doing something else or something. I don't know what it was. So there was a, a period there where that was it for, for the regular gigs at, at some of those places. They, they became more rock and roll oriented or more rockabilly oriented. Yeah, Skip had a, 
pilot's license. You mentioned that, and uh, that's why I never fly anywhere with less than four jet engines. He he did, with me one time. <laughs> I know I did. He, he said, have you ever been in a stall? I said, what's that? <laughs> he showed me, and I think that... Uh, let me the show you. Let me show you. Show you. <laughs> I don't do little planes anymore, because of you. Well, Steve, I don't see what you're worried about. They never have one miss the ground yet. <laughs> Anyhow, Pat Mason, uh, Pat Mason, and uh, we have to give a lot of credit to the Cecilini family at, um, at the D Street Corral. They were right there uh, in that whole thing, and Tony Dumont, too. I was going to say, tell us about Tony Dumont's club. And, uh, well, it was just another dance hall right down there where the, I think the freeway is right in the way now, where it was, isn't it? Down there around somewhere in that area. It's been so long ago. Yeah, lots of trees in the parking lot. I, uh, is there? That was to be. I mean, yeah. Was just... And uh, when we were kids, now I don't know, not so much Steve, because he, he's a Canadian. I was still in Canada, so I know nothing about that. Yeah. Um, we, uh, there, there's a place out here by Battleground, Washington, called Dollar's Corner, and there's Dollar Corner Barn Dance, mm -hmm. and that building is still there. And as kids, if, if we weren't playing on Saturday night, we would go out there to where Willie and the guys and Jim Henderson and those guys were playing, and we'd sit there hoping that they'd ask us to get up and play for a couple of minutes while they went to have a drink or whatever it was, was musicians did in those days. See, we learned everything from those guys. Everything? Everything. Everything. Uh, there's a thing in Willie's book that I asked Joe not to put in that book, and he did it anyhow. And uh, I don't know. Personally, I think Willie'd be proud of it. But <laughs> you want me to tell you? Sure. Okay, as a young kid, I knew nothing at all. Nothing about girls, nothing like that. We were just wanted to play our guitars. And girls didn't mean a whole lot. <laughs> I'm not speaking for him, uh, but I was in the car with Willie and two or three other guys, maybe Ken Ward, I'm not sure anymore, it's been so long ago, and the driver of the car dropped Willie off at this house, and uh, some nice young lady answered the door, and I thought, I'm just a kid, I'm a teenager, and I don't know anything about this sort of thing. And so this young lady comes to the door, and we leave Willie there, and I was telling Joe that wrote his new biography, because Joe asked me for a lot of stuff. And I said, Joe, don't put that in the book. And he said, oh, okay. And the book came out, and there it was. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you've got to be careful what you tell writers, and uh, make sure there's some substance to it. There's one sitting right beside you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyhow, uh, but Willie's a, Willie's a good guy, he still is today, he was then. I can't say anything bad about him, and, uh, and uh, he would give you the time of day if it was possible. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you're not only um, a super, super accomplished pedal, uh, steel player, rather, but you also have a massive collection, don't you? You looking at me or him? To Ray. Oh, Ray. Yeah. <laughs> I've been known to have a few. One or two. How many do you have? Uh, it's about 16 or 18. Wow. wow. I have to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and your idol when you were growing up was Jerry Bird? Yes. Right? Was, is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you became president of the Span Club at one point? Is that uh, sec right? Secretary. 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 Um, what do you, what things do you take from Jerry Bird that you feel like you have in your music? What, what, where is this? I try to love on to everything that he did. I've noticed he's copied a lot of my stuff. Here's <laughs> 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 on his records regularly. But, uh, no, he uh, inspired me a great deal. I probably have, oh, 50 or 60 letters that he hand wrote back to me and, um, <laughs> just, uh, it's been an inspiration. I mean, there's so much that he's gotten out of a little six or seven string guitar that other guys with 20 pedals have never been able to equal, in my opinion at least. And uh, yeah. just a fabulous guy.
about uh, 40, 45 some years ago, Chet Atkins came to town and did a concert downtown. And um, there was, uh, Chet was doing his stuff and uh, Chet was kind of answering some questions and a, and a steel player that we all know raised his hand and said, are you gonna ever do any more recordings with uh, Jerry Bird? And uh, Chet said, uh, something about be him being a Hawaiian steel player, the best Hawaiian steel player there was. You know who that guy was? No. You. <laughs> I, mean, I was in the audience, but I couldn't get close to you. So I, I've seen you stand up and ask Jeff Atkins that question. And a shirt memory, still do. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd like to ask about Ripcord, um, because yes. we... You want to know how, how I got that name? I'd like to know how about you got the name and also... Um, okay, I designed the label. Uh -huh. That little folder guy that comes down, I sit at my desk and designed that. I was flying skydivers at the time and there was also a TV show called Ripcord. And I needed the name of the label because I had just built uh, the Ripcord Studios, which originally was Boyd Cleaners in Vancouver. And I bought that building and stripped it all out. I didn't know I couldn't afford it. And, but anyhow, I went to work on that. I stripped that out and built that studios in there, and I designed the Ripcord label and the Danco label. And I bought a 350 Ampex recorder. And I had Heck Harper come over to the house, and I was going to record Heck over at the house. And all of a sudden, realized I got a recorder, but I don't have a mixer, I don't have no microphones, I don't have no playback equipment. And I thought, oh my God. I gotta go to the store tomorrow and find some stuff to make this work because the recorder won't work without anything else. Well, I ended up so far in debt with that ripcord. I mean, I had the first Ampex 440 machine north of San Francisco and the first Ampex 440 8 machine north of San Francisco. And how many tracks is that at that time? Uh, four track and eight track. Uh -huh. And we had. Uh, uh, Earl Meister, that owned United Radio here in Portland, built the original board for Ripcord Studios, and we had 46 longitude preamps in that. And I don't know where in the world I got the money for that. But I ended up with that studio, got it going. We had uh, Haggard had been there, Jerry Wallace had been there, the Fleetwoods had been there. I mean, there's just no end to the people that have been through that studio. Plus, Martin was there as well, right? Well, I, uh, Pat Mason actually produced the first Buzz Martin record. Uh -huh. After that, I produced all of the albums until I believe either Bob Blum or Gene Breeden may have produced the last one. But I'll tell you something I did with Buzz Martin, and it's, it's nothing more than the fact that he was a great writer. And Buzz Martin, in order to record him, I had to keep a fifth of Jack Daniels in the studio because he was, he was a logger. I mean, I'm not saying that all loggers need Jack Daniels, but some of them like it. And I had to. He had to drink his Jack Daniels in order to record where he could sing anywhere on pitch. And, and so we'd finally get him through that Whistle Punk Pete and all of those songs. And, uh, and, uh, Buzz Martin and I had a number one record, a local number one record, on used log truck with just him talking about it and me playing a little bit of Merle Travis type guitar behind him. Yeah, that's all spoken word, right? He's, uh, yeah, he's like reciting. Uh, right? But you know, if you listen to his writing, uh, the loggers knew for a fact that he was actually a logger because he was writing about what they knew about and they could spot a guy that didn't know what he was talking about and thus didn't know what he was talking about. So we sold, now get this, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, and Alaska sell 1% of the national record market back in the 60s. The rest are sold elsewhere in the United States. We sold 100,000 albums in a 1% market. I had the same distributor in Seattle, Fidelity Electric, that uh, RCA had. And they didn't believe me, and I said, well, there's my records, if they take a look, and they take a look at them. But 100,000 albums in a 1% market had, I sold that on the East Coast. Of course, there wouldn't have been the market for it, because we didn't have the timber there, but we sold in Canada, we were with Warner Brothers in Canada, we all sold in New Zealand, any place they would log, we sold those Bud Martin records. Wow, did that help pay for all the microphones eventually? Well, it did. I, uh, Buzz Martin was a was a good guy, and his 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 arms were bigger than my legs. I mean, he, he, he you know 
We need hay for breakfast, it was so strong. Have you mentioned you had um, Bonnie Guitar? Did she produce there? Or, or? Uh, Bonnie and I have done some projects together here, here at Ripcord and also at RCA in Los Angeles. We did some projects there too. Did and you uh, Bonnie that? Guitar was one of the owners of Dalton Records. Did you know that? And she's still alive. She lives in Soap Lake. Yeah. <laughs> did you sing that Buzz Martin, without his Jack Daniels, even talked off key? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would say so. But, but what I what I liked about him as I, over the years, as I listened to the material over again, I just realized how good it really was. I mean, how straight ahead and Logger's home brew, and he called his wife Biscuit. That's the, that was his pet name for her. And and the, the sad part of the whole thing is Buzz Martin. His family always thought that we were cheating him on the royalties. And they didn't understand that Elvis and Frank Sinatra and all those guys got 4.5% of 90% of the retail selling price of the record. Now, Beth, you know what I'm talking about because you probably did some record deals. Most people say, if a record sells for a dollar, why don't I get half? But that's not how it works. There's too much involved in production. If the uh, record company could front $100,000 for, uh, for a new album, they took that off of the top before you got a dime. That was their money back for doing that for you. And so most people, and they didn't understand that. And I loaned Buzz $3,000 to buy a tavern down in, uh, down near uh, Dallas, somewhere down there. And the poor guy, the dark tavern burned down right after he <laughs> <No. laughs> That was a bad one. Um, I hate to break this up because I could, I'd like to keep going, but there's also some music that's going to happen. Oh, yeah. 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 Now some of those had three chords, and maybe some had four, but we didn't know it yet. <laughs> and so we're going to go back and try to duplicate that, and you're going to say to yourself, well, they don't sound like they played together very long ago, and you're going to be right. <laughs> Great. It's In fact, uh, wait, go ahead. we might start the whole thing with the theme song from the Heck Harper Show. Heck Harper Show, so we're going to do it right. Forever. Yep. Awesome. Thank you All so right. much. Okay, thank you.